Welcome back to The Ideal Cast. I'm your host, Gene Kim. I want to let you know that all the amazing talks we showcased at DevOps Enterprise Summit Virtual Europe this year are now available on demand in the video library. Visit itrevolution.com slash videos to watch them. They are fantastic. You're listening to The Ideal Cast with Gene Kim, brought to you by IT Revolution. Welcome to another episode of The Ideal Cast. I am recording this at the end of May 2021, when we are currently in a race to deliver vaccines into everyone's arms in the shortest possible time. Quite literally, the success of this endeavor affects the health and the economies of the entire planet. Many months ago, my mentor, Dr. Steven Spear, observed that the ability for vaccine clinics to adapt in order to win this race has been decidedly mixed. Some vaccine clinics are able to get 100% of the vaccines allocated to them successfully into people's arms. Others struggle to achieve 30%. The result is not just wasted precious doses, which could have gone to other vaccine clinics where they would have been successfully delivered, but also causes other serious consequences. Every day that people are not vaccinated, they risk getting sick and in turn getting others sick. Yet, despite it all, against all our expectations, the finish line is potentially, if not within sight, it is now certainly within our ability to contemplate. Just yesterday, the U.S. White House announced that half the U.S. population has been vaccinated, up from 0% six months ago. Over the last couple of months, I've gotten a glimpse into the incredible unleashing of human creativity and problem solving that has made this possible. In conversations with various people involved in the vaccination process, I heard amazing stories about how vaccination clinics were able to increase the number of vaccinations delivered by 4x, 6x, by doing things like changing the on-site registration flows, or even reversing the path that people took through a building to put the elevator after the vaccine administration instead of before it. But those operations are happening on a much smaller scale than what is currently happening at Oregon's largest vaccination site at the Oregon Convention Center. At the end of March, I had the privilege of spending three hours with Trent Green, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Legacy Health. We were at the Portland Convention Center, where they are currently delivering 8,000 vaccines per day to people who need them. This is up from 2,000 per day in January. It was such an honor to see firsthand how human creativity has enabled them to ramp up vaccination capacity so dramatically. It was literally one of the most uplifting things I've gotten to see in years. And I am so grateful for the work that Mr. Green and team have been doing. On April 28th, the Willamette Week published an article called Oregon's largest vaccination site is a logistical masterpiece. We take you inside. They described the site as a medical Disneyland, (laughs) like the best airport in the world, comparing it to the operations of a Swiss watch, where over 226,000 Oregonians have been vaccinated. Contrast that to other mass vaccination sites where people described it as having a war zone or apocalypse vibe, requiring people to wait hours in line, sometimes lines to get in another line. Ever since my visit to the mass vaccination site with Mr. Green, I found myself talking about it over and over to so many people, and I had more questions I wanted to ask him. And for so many reasons, I am so glad that he agreed to be interviewed. So today, I have not only Mr. Trent Green, but also my mentor, Dr. Steven Spear from MIT Sloan as well. I've actually known Mr. Green for years. I've always loved talking with him as he's so full of insights. In fact, so many things he's mentioned to me, often in passing, become areas of intense study for me. In fact, when we were discussing the phenomenon of the square in the Unicorn Project, which describes the need for vast escalations to get anything done that requires integrated problem solving from different silos, he told me a couple of things that then became the topic of repeated conversations between Dr. Spear and me. I'm so delighted that I have on today both Mr. Trent Green and Dr. Steven Spear. Mr. Green has been at Legacy Health for 12 years which is a $2 billion integrated delivery health system based here in Portland, Oregon, which is comprised of eight hospitals, a 600 provider multi-specialty medical group, a regional laboratory, and a research institute. And he has been in the healthcare industry 
for over two decades. So, Mr. Green, I've introduced you in my words. Can you introduce yourself in your own words and describe uh, what you've been working on these days? Well, it's an honor to be here, Gene, with you and Stephen. I'm sort of feeling in rarefied air here. I'm a Chief Operating Officer at Legacy Health. As you mentioned, we're an eight-hospital system. We own 50% of a health plan. We have well over 800 employed physicians as part of our health system. We are the leading provider of health care in the state of Oregon. What I am specifically charged with is improvement. So every day I wake up trying to figure out how do we reduce costs, how do we improve quality, ultimately how do we enhance value for the customer. The way that is expressed actually right now is we're on a lean journey. We are really in the early stages of implementing what we're referring to as a legacy health operating system. We're trying to implement a system of improvement that is organized, follows a scientific method, has you know elements of real-time problem solving, help chain, a topic that you and I have talked a lot about, and hopefully we have an opportunity to explore a little bit today, tiered huddles, leader standard work, et cetera. We are literally just in the early stages of embarking on that journey. Between you and Steve, who will introduce himself in just a couple of moments, I'm probably the most ignorant of how healthcare systems work. Can you describe the role of the chief operating officer versus, say, the chief medical officer? And, and you know, what are the key leadership positions in a healthcare organization? Sure. So I report to our chief executive officer, and our executive team consists of myself, chief operating officer. We have a chief financial officer. We have a chief medical officer. We have an individual. We refer to him as our chief integration officer. He handles a lot of our newer type ventures. And then we obviously have information uh, technology and human resources all part of the executive team. For my role, Chief Operating Officer, I have responsibility for all hospital operations. I have responsibility for all pharmacy services, all laboratory services. So I handle what probably represents oh, 70% of the total business on a day-to-day basis that runs through our facility. And I partner a lot with our chief medical officer on the clinical aspects, quality aspects, our quality agenda. So there's a nice dyad between myself and our chief medical officer. And then we have another individual who's titled in our system, chief integration officer, who has uh, responsibility for our medical group and a lot of our kind of... What I would characterize as newer ventures. So we've gotten into urgent care, as a for instance, outpatient surgery. We have, as I said earlier, an investment in a health plan. And so he has responsibility for managing those kind of newer aspects of where we're trying to take our delivery system, all in pursuit of value for customers. An important business for people who need to benefit from the healthcare system. Yeah. That's fantastic. So Steve, I'm so delighted that you're on today. Could you briefly introduce yourself and maybe take a moment to describe the work that you've done in the healthcare industry? And if I remember correctly, that was actually done with someone that Trent and I have talked so much about, the Honorable Paul O'Neill, famously the CEO of Alcoa. Yeah, Gene, thank you. And Trent, really great to connect in this fashion. My work in general was around the question, why is it When some organizations try to pull together many specialists towards some collaborative effort towards common purpose, why are some few of them so much better at what they do than everybody else? And you start thinking about the benefit of us so much better. It means much more value generated to meet society's needs. It means much greater return on the investment some have made in the effort. And it means that those doing the work have a much richer and more certain realization that what they did was important to somebody else. So that's kind of like the general theme. How do you pull the pieces together so the whole is much, much greater than the sum of the parts? In terms of work we did in healthcare, healthcare is just simply ripe for this kind of introducing, this kind of thinking and doing, because it's a sector which originally started with just individual doctors providing care. And, and everything was about that magic moment of touch where, you know, the term of art is to lay on hands, right? And what happened is science and technology advanced in healthcare, the number of specialists involved in bringing magic to that moment increased exponentially. What didn't advance along at the same pace was uh, an understanding of how to do that integration of the many into one. And so we got invited in to do some really inspiring work, inspiring because of the people with whom we work, not because of what we actually did, but inspiring work in the Pittsburgh healthcare community back in the early 2000s. This was picking up off of a couple of pilots we did in the local healthcare community here in Boston with Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. And long and short, it kind of proved out the idea that if you have a systematic way of creating systems, of integrating systems, the ability for people to express their fullest potential, it just goes up geometrically. 
Trent, I trust that resonates with your own experiences, at least at the high level. Oh, completely. You know, we, it's interesting, we talk about this a lot. Our caregivers, I mean, the clinicians in general, they diagnose problems and they implement solutions. They try a number of things, and not just our physicians, but our frontline staff as well. We talk frequently about the amount of real-time problem solving that happens in our facilities every day. The challenge is that oftentimes we observe that our people, they solve problems, but they're often workarounds. They don't get to really fundamentally solving to root. And so what we're trying to now unpack as a system is how do we liberate people to actually solve problems, not just workarounds so you can get through the next thing or the next patient, because that happens all the time. We stack up all these workarounds. And they're not all the same. Same problems encountered in one facility is solved this way. It's solved this way in another facility, and neither of which ultimately get to what the root cause of the problem mm-hmm. is. And so what we're trying to step back and do is how do we create a mechanism by which we can consistently solve problems ultimately to root and eliminate whatever harm or process breakdown it creates. Uh, what Dr. Spear mentions, it totally resonates with, with our experience. I'd love to put that in a box for a moment. And so before we talk about integrated problem solving in the healthcare system in the large, Trent, I'd love to rewind the clock to January or whenever that was, when you realized that you might be responsible for standing up a big part of the mass vaccination clinic. Can you talk about what those first days of operations were like? If I remember correctly, you said you were struggling to get 2,000 doses out a day and eventually heading to 8,000. So can you describe what that felt like in the early days? There's a long story that that we don't need to rehash on how we got to ultimately standing up a a mass fax site. But when we concluded that we needed to do that, you're you're right. We ran an operation scheduled to operate 10 hours a day, very frequently (laughs) operated 12 to 13 hours a day. And we were lucky if we could crank out 200 doses an hour and, you know, ultimately get 2,000 doses in people's arms during a day. And it was extraordinarily high stress. Uh, we were trying to be as efficient as possible, but we had never done something like this. Uh, what we actually put together was a collaboration of four competing health systems. So you had that sort of dynamic to manage, but also just the complexity of, of doing it. We immunize patients every day. We don't immunize patients with a two-dose regimen that has a lot of care and handling on the actual pharmaceutical side. So that added complexity. So just a lot of early stress. What we found is, back to these kind of systems and improving systems, we had all these microsystems, right? We had a registration microsystem. We had a vaccination microsystem. We had a pharmacy microsystem. We had a observation area microsystem. And what we didn't understand in the beginning at all was how is you made a change in one of those areas, we forgot that we needed to evaluate the implications in the other microsystems. And so we created a lot of our own problems. And it took us a while to get to where we are now. We're administering close to 8,000 doses a day. We do that in seven hours. So over 1,100 an hour is what we're up to. Now we can do it in Oh, in less than 30 minutes, and that includes the 15 minutes of observation that, that's required. We could never do that in the uh, in the early stages. So we've made a ton of improvement. I think one principle that I learned early was you can't improve a process until you stabilize a process. And so one of the things that we struggled with early on is people would have bright ideas. Oh, we should do this. We should do that. We should do this. We attempted to stack way too many improvements on, and it would just make things, frankly, it made things worse either in that microsystem or in another microsystem. So we learned, and then we started to slow walk our improvements a little bit and do a better job of testing things before we actually ultimately implement. And so before we talk about the mechanics of that. Could you talk about maybe some of the major milestones as you went from 2,000 a day to 8,000 a day? What strikes as kind of like the, the breakthroughs that you would point to in that journey? Yeah, so our first date of operation at um, uh, the Oregon Convention Center, which is where we run this mass vac site, was January 25th. We started first administrations would go in people's arms at nine o'clock in the morning. We would have people there at six in the morning doing training, doing walkthroughs, making sure everybody was in the right chairs. Theoretically, the last appointment was at seven o'clock at night. But as I mentioned, we routinely went over in those early days. There have been so many improvements. I'm not even sure where to start. I think some key milestones for us have been we've never wasted a dose, never wasted a single dose. Now, 
Oftentimes, what that meant is at the end of the day, if we overproduced in pharmacy, again, one of the microsystems, if we overproduced in pharmacy, there'd be a lot of people on the phone trying to find people that were eligible to receive the vaccine that could come to the convention center quickly. We now have a process down where we are extremely efficient at the end of day operation so that oftentimes we'll have to open a, another vial to finish the day, but we still don't waste and we don't have to find 50 people at the end of the day to administer the vaccine to. So I think you know key milestones were uh, stabilization of, of processes. We've actually reduced hours now. So as I said, we were doing 2,000 in, in 10 hours, which often ended up being 12 hours. We've now moved it to a seven-hour operation. What we found is the burnout was really, this is, it's intense when you're in there and recruitment of volunteers or paid staff and so on and trying to run multiple shifts just became too complex for us. So we actually got faster when we condensed the mm -hmm. time. So we went from 10 hours for a period of time, we ran 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That was really taxing for people. So now we've moved the operation to five days a week, seven hours a day when we're when we're operating. And for instance, my daughter's 16 years old. She became eligible two weeks ago. Last night, I took her to the Oregon Convention Center. I was such a proud father walking her through. I was, she, she didn't really care about you know all the things that dad had done, but we were in and out in 34 minutes. Now that included 10 minutes of waiting because we were one of the last appointments of the day. And at the end of the day, we do do what we refer to as a pharmacy drawdown where we slow down the process a little bit so we don't overproduce. And that included a 10 minute delay. And But that was car door to car door, 34 minutes. Awesome. I mean, it was such a heady day. And one of the things that really caught my attention was how how you moved the area of operations from like one of the banquet halls to the, the huge hundred, you know, sixteen thousand foot area. Yeah, uh, can you talk about like what led to that? Yeah, so we started out actually in a in uh, as Gene mentions in a ballroom, and we thought that would be sufficient space for us. You know, frankly, there's nothing going on at the Oregon Convention Center, <laughs> so we could have as much space as as we wanted. Uh, we thought we would have sufficient space in the ballroom, but this is even another learning. We didn't design that space very well, so we had kind of a water. I would call it a waterfall concept. So you would enter the ballroom. That would be where registration was. Just behind registration is where the vaccination center was, and then the waterfall concept was you. Either Either went left or right, and that's where the observation would occur. Huh. Well, the problem with having two observation centers is we had to double the number of staff. We had to have double the number of people that are sitting in there. We had to have two medical tents for people. And so we built in some inefficiencies in the beginning. And then we also realized we just didn't have enough space to process we could only end up doing about 500 per hour was our max in that space. It just wasn't enough. So we moved to the exhibit halls where we had ample space. And then we, we modified our approach where we created six pods. And the pod strategy was really key because it just enabled people to move that much more rapidly and us to process that many uh, more people efficiently. Yeah. When we first moved to the space, we actually had a consult from Starbucks. <laughs> so, so Starbucks had been very involved in the state of Washington and their mass vax uh, operations. And so I met this gentleman, Josh, at the convention center in February, the first day we had moved into the new space. And he said, well, do you mind if I take some time studies and uh, I'd be happy to give you some suggestions for improvement. I was, no, that'd be great. He spent, I don't know, half a day there, observed all of our, our systems, came back, sat down with me and said, I gotta be honest, I don't really have any suggestions for you. You guys are doing such a good job of processing. I want to go back and study this a little bit more. He said, you might be able to open one more pod, but beyond that, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> That's great. In fact, I'll put a link to the FEMA video that was put yeah, together that featured yeah. the Starbucks first yeah, and then the back of yeah. your head too, Trent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Before yeah. we get to Steve, so kind of when you look back at this, I mean, what are you most proud of getting the advanced vaccination clinic this far? Well, to be a healthcare, any role in healthcare the last 14 months, is, it's been hard. February 28th is when our first case was identified in the state of Oregon. And I still remember that day. It was a Friday night. I was supposed to be at a high school girls basketball game. And I spent the entire time out in the parking lot on the telephone trying to figure out what to do. It wasn't even a case in our hospital. You know, we'd been monitoring COVID and the last year has been hard. Emotionally, it's been hard for people, management of protective equipment. I got to say, though, this vaccination effort has been a bright spot for me personally. I get so much joy. One of the things we lose, uh, I think we've lost, is recognition of how important smiles are with masks. It's really hard to tell when somebody's smiling. But I can tell you, when you go to the Oregon Convention Center and you walk around, you see everybody masks, you can tell they're smiling. You can <laughs> see it in their eyes. And that's just been really gratifying for me. We worked with the governor to actually move 
teachers ahead of seniors. That was a controversial move, but Oregon had been very slow in restarting schools. And we worked with superintendents of schools who were phenomenal partners to help us test our systems. Again, we didn't know we didn't know how to do this. And they were organized. We were organized. We figured out a way to get them scheduled efficiently. And so, you know, Gene, there's just, I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life, the role that I played in this vaccination effort. And it's just been really personally gratifying for me and for our people. I, you know, I can tell people's spirits at work have even been lifted. I'm now vaccinated and they're vaccinated and there's still protection, but it's been really hard in healthcare. And this has been a bright spot in the last 14 months. Wonderful. I just read that amazing article in the Willamette Week describing the vaccination site as a magical Disneyland, yeah. like the best airport in the world, uh, like an effing Swiss watch. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, you can feel yeah. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's very gratifying. Steve, you know, you had told me something some months ago that I, I'd literally, my jaw dropped and that also became the focus of lots of effort and you know other studies. You made the observation that some hospitals as they're delivering vaccines, you know, they can get a 100% of vaccines in people's arms, whereas some are struggling to get 30%. And then you also made the observation that some school systems, once the decision is made to return to in-person learning, some can reopen on a dime, you know, maybe in weeks, others take months <laughs> or quarters. And you made the claim that both of those are probably a very good proxy for an organization's ability to adapt, learn, act upon learnings, re-engineer all the relevant processes, and really unleashing the creativity of the entire workforce, especially on the front line. So to what extent does the story that Trent just told, does that affirm your hypotheses? On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 is like not at all. 10 is exactly in line with what you expected. Yeah, I'm going with a spinal tap. This is an 11. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, I just want to, first of all, say thank you to Trent and his colleagues for all the hard work they've done, both in the gloomy times and and now to get us to the end of the tunnel. Just to put things in perspective, people were talking about having to be a masked society well into 2022 and even 2023. And the fact that by mid-2021, we'll have some return to normal is fantastic. And again, to Trent and his colleagues that during the dark periods, they took on real personal risk to help usher the rest of us through this terrible event. What I'd like to encourage anyone listening to this is to listen to Trent's account with great appreciation. It's well-deserved, but also to recognize that in his account, there's some general lessons which are applicable to them too. And I'll just pick up on a couple. One was this idea of the problem was we didn't run a system, we were running a series of microsystems. That is common. And Gene and I have spent a lot of time talking about why we end up with these very complex organizations, which look like these kind of loose confederations, loose collections of microsystems that don't really come together. The reality is that's true. And where you get systems of systems, to parlay one of our favorite books, Team of Teams, is by actually having someone draw the line through those systems to figure out the sequence, the dependencies by which value gets created. And when you start seeing the system of systems, then you can start doing all the system level kaizen, and the system level improvement to make things better. So that, that was one point. And again, why I, I encourage people to listen beyond the well-deserved appreciation is that anyone listening to this podcast, they are probably working within a microsystem, which is part, of, not part of a microsystem in a larger system, it's just microsystem next to a lot of other microsystems. So that's one. <laughs> The second thing that uh, Trent said, of the many things he said, but the second thing that comes to mind is this idea that first we need a standard before we start to improve. And that's so key because until we actually make a sound declaration of what we think is going to work, we can't find out we're wrong. You know, until we make that, create a standard, create a declaration, you know, set up the hypothesis for an experiment, it's just air confetti. You know, it's just nothing. And even if the first standard you create, and inevitably something as complex and novel as uh, mass vaccination, the first standard you create is going to be deficient in some way, at least you can see the deficiencies in the standard and then quickly close the loop and find out what's wrong with the uh, standard and modify, modify, modify until you get to a better standard. Whether it's the you know realization that waiting to the left and to the right complicates things. Oh, fine. One waiting place from one location to another location. Fine. Again, that wasn't in the first standard, it was, it, but it was in version three and four and 12 and 24, and et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, like the slowdown in the pharmacy, which is if we don't stop the pharmacy filling syringes with some lead time, and then you probably, once you had that realization, I'm willing to bet you had six iterations on just how much time you needed, right? Oh, probably 15. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Here at IT Revolution, 
we achieved something pretty amazing just before the DevOps Enterprise Summit Virtual Europe Conference. We added every one of our past conference talks dating all the way back to 2014 into our video library. It is now the best place to watch these videos and it is getting better and better all the time. It's super easy and fast to search for talks, either by descriptions, speakers, companies, or topics. Slides are available for all the talks. And for all of the plenary talks this time around, we have posted transcripts for them too. In other exciting news, we have launched the DevOps Enterprise Journal, Spring 2021, which features white papers from some of the most popular 2020 DevOps Enterprise Summit presentations. Download it at itrevolution.com slash journal. And then the one thing, and then I'll stop gushing praise on this, is like I said, there were three. One was we live inside microsystems rather than a, a system of systems. And this, uh, you need a standard to make an improvement. But the other is where Trent ended, which was you can see the smiles behind the masks. You know, February 28th, 2020, no one was smiling. But when this kicked off with your mass vaccination, probably, you know, January 2021, still no one was smiling, even though you were giving out vaccinations, because it was just so overburdensome. It was so frustrating. It was so difficult to actually do the right thing. And now here we are in mid-April and people are doing, quote unquote, the same work, but they're doing it with gracefulness. They're doing it with appreciation. And the thing I just want to offer, why is anyone ever asked to do work where they can't smile yeah. with the sense that they've done something that someone else will appreciate? You know, I almost have to get to the point that it's a choice that we make and that people responsible for other people make, that we make a choice as to whether we're going to be energetic and open-minded and inquisitive like Trent and his colleagues and try to get systems to evolve and adapt and adjust so that the people in the system want to smile because they know that they're doing something appreciated. And it's an alternative that's chosen if we don't do that. Anyway, this has been a fantastic, I'm going to stop talking because I want to listen. (laughs) <laughs> well, in fact, Trent, I think as Steve was talking, it kind of revealed why I was so excited to get the three of us together. And I think part of it is just the notion of theory building versus theory testing. <laughs> I yeah. think yeah. to be able to, I, I love the principle of parsimoniousness in science. And the goal is yeah. to create the fewest number of principles, explain the most amount of observable phenomena, come up with some hypotheses and be able to test them, right? And then you know, gain some surprising insights. So just even in this conversation so far, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of that. So I have a theory for you or like a hypothesis and uh, one of them, so I was reviewing the pictures I took at the vaccination clinic at the convention center. And clearly, you know, there are a lot of good ideas that led to this massive expansion in uh, capacity. I'm assuming that a lot of those good ideas didn't come from you. So can you talk about the process of which good ideas were surfaced and maybe in two paths, one where they all pile up and make a big mess, <laughs> right? Uh, where you can't isolate whether it was actually better or worse and why yeah, versus yeah. like the more systematic sequencing, you know, your role in that. Yeah, sure. We tried to adhere to this principle that the people closest to the work, you know, they're the ones that know the work and can improve the work. And so we did a lot of listening to them. What barriers were they encountering? What suggestions did they have? So we did a lot of listening. I, I want to comment on the standards. One thing we realized very early on is that we actually needed to document and adjust on nearly a daily basis standard work. For people, what would happen is we would have a new a new vaccination lead for the day. Well, the vaccination lead who was here yesterday, they wanted to do it this way, and we said, "No, here's the standard that you have to apply for every vaccinator." So, and we're not having a lead make an individual adjustment. They came from different healthcare systems. One thing that we did pretty early on, it was really smart, is every morning when we would meet for our daily safety huddle. We had a plan for the day. This is how many appointments we have. These are hours of operation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we went through it for every area. And then on the back, we had a QR code. And a QR code was for suggestions. Mm. What we wanted to do is actually have people capture in real time, in whatever area, what suggestions they had for improvement. And we made a principle early on that you could not make, you could not implement any improvements at that point in time. You had to document what the issues were. So you had to do a little investigation, capture you know, what, what was the experience, what happened, et cetera. And so we really tried to push it to the front line. And what we spent a lot of time on, this is another thing I'm, I'm, I'm learning is, and, and I'm guilty of this, it's, it's often hard for me as a senior executive in a healthcare system, I think unfairly often place the burden on myself that I have to know everything and have a solution for everything. And it's sometimes 
sometimes it's hard for me to even step back and have a beginner's mind on things. So what we what we really tried to to push people on is don't give us a solution. Help us really understand current state. So do a better job for us documenting what current state is, and then let's collaboratively figure out what would, you know, let's go back to what we think the ideal future state is, and then what are the gaps and how do we solve? So don't come with solutions, come with a good understanding of current state. Even in the idea box, right, there's actually a little bit of a structure to be able to say, you know, not just the idea, but describe what you think will, this improvement will lead to, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we did do some testing. We actually set up one of the big challenges that we had, we first wanted to target waiting. We wanted the process to run as efficiently as possible. We threw a lot of people at the problem early as opposed to trying to solve with improvements in process. But one thing, Gene, we've not been able to solve, and you can attest to this since you've been, we have a lot of motion. Huh. There's, a, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of walking. And we had a hypothesis early on, why don't we create a pod model and let's move the vaccinator and the registrar around around the patients as opposed to have the patients move. Hmm. So the concept was that we would have, call it, let's, for the sake of discussion, we would have eight chairs in a kind of circle or semicircle. And the registrar and vaccinator would move from patient to patient. We had a model where you'd have two registrars to one vaccinator. Registration takes longer than vaccination. <laughs> and they would move around and the patient would sit there. They would get registration, vaccination, and their 15 minutes of observation in that chair. We tried to test that and it that was too much for the team. That became very stressful for the vaccinator, actually, because they were trying to catch up the entire time. So anyway, just an example of that was a suggestion that was made that maybe this would be a way that we could attack this excess movement problem, waste that we have. And that came up through discussion. We kind of batted it around. And, and one afternoon, actually for three or four days, we ran a model where on the side of our vaccination center, we actually tested that. And we tested how quick it was and was that going to actually, and we ultimately determined that it was, that was too much too fast, if you will. And, and uh, we ultimately didn't think that we were going to be able to process as many people in, uh, in, in using that approach. And so can you talk a little bit about what was your specific role? My biggest role and the role of my colleagues, my, I, I don't want to leave out the chief operating officers of the other health systems who were, who were partners with me in this, uh, where we set out kind of the overarching principles you know, we're going to use a single electronic health record. Everything is going to be scheduled. These are the hours of, of operation. We set those out. And then again, we let the people do the work. Occasionally there were things where we needed to break ties or we need, you know, a, a larger decision that needed to be made, but the actual true guts of kind of the operation, we let the people that were closest to the work do it. I will also say, I need to, to mention that we had two performance excellence engineers, I would call them, who worked with us, and they helped study a lot of the ideas. They yeah. would observe, back to, to Steve's point about the kind of systems, they saw the whole thing. They were all, all they cared about was overall cycle time. They didn't care about what the cycle time was for registration. They wanted the overall process of vaccinating individuals, and they helped us see the whole, and they were really, really instrumental in advising me on improvements and kind of standards that I needed to enforce or principles that I needed to enforce. So Randy was one of these? Randy and Eileen. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. And I also have to imagine, so I'm, I'm thinking about the way I remember it, whether it was pharmacy or vaccination or registration, they all had a department lead that you know would rotate in and out. Correct. So I would imagine that those leads would be responsible for their area, but certain things, <laughs> they are also embedded in a larger system. And so things that would affect the groups around them would require some person in a higher level of authority that could see <laughs> and you know sequence or prioritize or something. To what extent is that true? And that really became in your domain. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. And that helped create our tiered huddling structure. A morning huddle with all the leads for the day, and and we would talk about what was happening. If there was a change to a standard, we'd communicate the change to the standard. About two hours into operation on a daily basis, we have a safety huddle. Has anything come up that we need to know about that we're concerned about? And then in the afternoon, about two hours before we close, we did a plan for the day, a look ahead. What are we learning today? Is there anything we're learning today that we need to think about and adjust for tomorrow? And then finally, at the end end of the day, we would bring a much larger group of people who who also incorporated scheduling. So 
What I just referred to, Gene, was kind of the daily operation on the ground. But then there are other microsystems that are involved here or other, uh, other players, that technology, scheduling, et cetera, that we needed to bring in and, and have a larger conversation about any improvements or, or challenges that we might have, might have experienced. So at the end of the day, we, we had what we referred to as the highest level tier. We referred to it as our CXO tier. So you'd have the chief operating officers and the chief medical officers of all the systems who would hear what happened that day and be responsible for if there's any major you know, process improvement or change or resource that was needed that was elevated to our attention to help solve. Got it. And just to confirm my understanding, so that you have the sort of the departments, you have the leads, yep. you have the, I'm kind of guessing the incident commander yep. and then the CXOs above that. Exactly. I'm guessing that it was really that incident commander who played an instrumental role in changing areas of the system outside and for anything that involved more than one component, one area. Yeah, they needed to be able to see the whole and understand the impact on the whole. And when I sat in that role, I often would consult with these performance excellence engineers who just get their insight on on suggestions that were were made. I want to stress, we tried not to make on a daily basis changes. I think we realized early on we made way too many changes. We did not have a stable system, so you, we couldn't improve the stable system. It was it was like the confetti that was mentioned earlier. Anything might improve, might help, or it might it may not help, or it might help in this area but not in another area. And so we really tried to take good care in overall improvements. This is so great. In fact, I mean, maybe as a Segue to the other sort of like big aha moment, and then Steve, I'll, I'd love any of your reflections. One of the most startling and amazing things that you had showed uh, both me and Dr. Chris Streer was just sort of the planning that went around this. I mean, you had talked about like, you know, if you kind of did the hard costs or soft costs, right? One, the expense of running this operation, right? If you include the FEMA staff and National Guard, right? You're looking at, you know, I think uh, it was three quarters of a million dollars a day. Yep, exactly. Just yep. for planning purposes. And uh, the thing that really I just was not prepared to hear, but it was probably one of the most hopeful things <laughs> I've ever heard was, sorry for if I mangle this, but you said, you know, with the advent of Moderna and the potentially and hopefully the Johnson Johnson vaccines, there were scenarios where the center could achieve its desired goals in, you know, say 11 weeks that, you know, with the vaccines that were easier to store and administer, the burden of this kind of extremely expensive mass vaccination site might be coming to an end. So whether it's 11 weeks or 17 weeks, I guess what blew me away was that strategic level thinking of like, how long does this need to be around? So I, if I understand correctly, that was kind of the thinking that was obviously in your domain, right? Of like, how long does this need to be around? How, you know, when can we release FEMA uh, National Guard staff. Oh, hundred percent. You know, back to the last fourteen months being incredibly difficult. We didn't have in our legacy health strategic plan that we were going to create a mass <laughs> vax site uh, <laughs> five years ago. Uh, we didn't even have this in our in our plans. Frankly. Uh, six months ago. As a result, we're, we're having to beg, borrow, and, and steal. We're paying overtime to nurses to work in the site. And so we're adding burden to our organizations. And yet, you know, the goal is let's get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we aligned on that really quickly. And I met with Pat Allen, the director of the Oregon Health Authority, very early on and was just doing math for him. Look, this is a two-dose regimen. This is how many people we have in the state of Oregon. If you want to assume for planning purposes that herd immunity is, is conferred at 70%, this is, this is how many doses in the state of Oregon we have to administer a day. In the metro area, we have to do this many. And so we use that as an organizing principle for how do we get this going and how do we turn this off by no later than the fall? So very early on, we outlined kind of those high level objectives or vision for the center. It seems like we're going to realize that much earlier than we had anticipated, which is great. I actually, as gratifying as this has been, it will be equally gratifying for me to turn this off. It, it, it's while it has been gratifying, it has also been grueling, and it's been hard hard on our people. Uh, just in terms of additional work to do, we're having a hard enough time managing patients in our hospital. Let alone now, we've got to add resources to support vaccination efforts. So it has been great. I am also looking forward to turning it off. Having said that, we're trying to catalog all of our learnings here because. We may have to turn this back on if these vaccines require boosters. Um, we need to be prepared to quickly mobilize again if we have to. Gene here. Holy cow, I didn't want to break in and interrupt Mr. Green's amazing story, but I think now would be a pretty good time to share some reactions and additional context. So, number one. 
I mentioned what an honor it was to get a glimpse behind the operations at the vaccination center with Mr. Green. And when he described how difficult things have been for healthcare systems during the COVID pandemic, I can't even really imagine what it must be like. Uh, for a hint, I refer you to two interviews that NPR Planet Money Indicator did with Dr. Patrick Cawley, who is CEO of the Medical University of South Carolina Health System in Charleston, which has over 10,000 employees, including 1,200 doctors. The first interview was in April 2020 and later in December 2020. He described what life has been like for hospital administrators. He talked about the preparation for potential surges due to COVID and the declines in surgeries, procedures, ambulatory visits, and hospitalizations, which resulted in $30 million in losses that month. In that April interview, he described how they temporarily had to lay off 900 care team members. And actually, they had performed that reduction in force the day before the interview, uh, which was just heartbreaking to hear. In that interview, Ms. Vanek Smith asked about how strange it was that they're having to do layoffs, despite that so many people are showing up in the emergency room. Dr. Colley responded about how he's had that same conversation a dozen times a day with people outside of the hospitals and health system because most of the revenue comes from surgeries or procedures, and those dropped 60 to 70% in the prior three weeks. And then he goes on to talk about the almost wartime-like preparations uh, they're having to go through, preparing for the expected COVID surge uh, in four to six weeks where they had set up 500 more beds in campus gyms and from reconfiguring internal space inside their hospitals. But in my mind, the more remarkable interview was in December, where he described the first vaccinations being administered to frontline healthcare workers. He said, I've seen multiple people getting vaccinated here. He described it as a surreal experience. He said it was the first time he's ever seen people cry uh, while being vaccinated. I'll quote from the interview. I've never seen that before. For many people, it was a surreal experience and there was an emotion by many folks who received it. There's just been so much on people during the last nine months. Think about what we've all been through, how we've completely upended our lives and our children's lives, and there's just so much weighing on people. So, you know, it didn't surprise me at all to see that happen. There's just this full-on elation as well. It's great to see all those different sorts of emotions mixing. And by the way, I have goosebumps as I'm uh, reading this. He continues... And finally, we're at the end of one journey and the beginning of another. So here we are giving vaccines for this thing that has wreaked so much havoc. And this is what will give us our lives back. This is what will allow us to be free and move around and get back in schools. And what scientists have done here in such a short period of time is nothing less than putting a man on the moon or some of those other great accomplishments. Holy cow, these were two great interviews. I will put links to the transcripts for those two interviews uh, in the show notes. So that gets us to number two. Mr. Green mentioned how, quote, I'm going to remember my role in this vaccination effort for the rest of my life. Well, I don't have much more to add than that. I just want to underscore how critical of a mission this is to vaccinate as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, so that we can return to societal normalcy. What Dr. Colley described was almost passing the baton to the next stage in the vaccination rollout. And my feelings during this interview and editing it is one steeped with a feeling of gratitude and awe and even elation learning about how Mr. Green and team went from delivering 2,000 vaccines per day to 8,000 vaccines per day. It's also mixed with a sense of grief because vaccines aren't yet available around the world. The most notable right now is India. Last week, I had numerous conversations with friends who described how they had family and friends die in the last several weeks. As I said in the beginning, this mission requires that we get everyone on the planet vaccinated as soon as possible. And hopefully all the miracles we've talked about today will not only make vaccines more widely available, but the lessons learned in these vaccination rollouts will help us all achieve this goal faster. Okay, number three. Dr. Kali described the availability of COVID vaccines as being the equivalent to landing a man on the moon. That's a super interesting observation. So Dr. Spear and I talked about how amazing it is that we have not just one vaccine approved for emergency use, but five vaccines approved for emergency use. 
And so at first glance, this seems nothing short of miraculous. After all, the typical vaccine takes five to 10 years to develop. In early 2019, most estimates were suggesting that it would take two to three years for a vaccine to be delivered. But apparently, uh, thanks to Project Warp Speed and other incredible heroics, somehow it seems to have unlocked a massive level of focus and investment that enabled vaccines to be developed in uh, record time, but also mass manufactured and distributed at a scale we may never have seen before. But I will suggest that this is actually doubly miraculous because of something Dr. Spear showed me last month. In the pharmaceutical space, it's called Eroom's Law. So you'll note that's the reverse of Moore's Law. So of course, Moore's Law is observing that CPU performance is increasing exponentially uh, now for nearly, say, five decades, where CPU performance has doubled every three to five years. Eroom's law is showing that in pharmaceuticals, for every $1 billion in R&D spend, the number of therapeutics making it to market is dropping exponentially. So in 1950, $1 billion of R&D would yield 100 therapeutics that made it to market. By 2020, that has dropped to less than one. <laughs> so the curve is a mirror image of Moore's law dropping logarithmically as time progresses. I am reading from the Wikipedia entry for Eroom's Law. It is the observation that drug discovery is becoming slower and more expensive over time despite improvements in technology, a trend first observed in the 1980s. The cost of developing a new drug roughly doubles every nine years inflation adjusted. This is in contrast to the exponential advancements of other forms of technology over time and was deliberately spelled as Moore's Law spelled backwards. So Steve and I have discussed that maybe Eroom's Law is what naturally happens when you increase the number of functional specialties that need to work together. Maybe it is the reason why Team of Teams had so much trouble in the before state dismantling the terrorist networks. Maybe it describes why pharmaceutical development is getting more and more expensive and taking more and more time. Maybe it describes what happened in software development and delivery. But somehow, when survival depends upon it, like in Team of Teams, or what birthed DevOps, or we suggest might have happened that enabled five COVID vaccines to be created that have been approved for emergency use. Or in the mass vaccination site that Trent oversaw, somehow organizations can break away from this dominant architecture that uh, suffers from Eroom's law and create genuinely new ways of working. Uh, Steve and I gave a presentation on this at DevOps Enterprise Summit last week, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Number four, I want to describe how challenging it was in this interview to cover all the ground I wanted to cover, uh, even in the two hours that we had. In just a little bit in this interview, I'm going to switch focus to how the lessons learned during the COVID vaccination rollout process could inform how to improve the overall healthcare system. But I wanted to share some of my firsthand observations from those amazing three hours at the Portland Convention Center in March. I was there with Dr. Chris Streer. He is an emergency physician who I met several years ago, and in June, he will be starting as the chief medical officer at Columbia Memorial. He has a long background of using theory of constraints to improve flow in a healthcare setting. And being a medical practitioner, it was uh, so fun and so useful to be able to compare notes with him and ask some questions about what we saw together at the convention center. I'll share some pictures I took that day. Uh, I would share more, but many I can't because I didn't obtain permission from all the people being vaccinated, which are protected under HIPAA regulations. So the day started out at 11 a.m., uh, well before the noon opening that uh, Mr. Green alluded to. Walking into the convention center, you could see already a line of people starting to queue up uh, well before their appointment time. We met Trent outside of the volunteer area. He was in a reflective vest, as were most of the staff. Uh, but his had the title of Incident Commander emblazoned on it. Just by that, you may have already gleaned that they were using the FEMA Incident Command System, which so many of us in the DevOps community have some familiarity with. And if you don't, check out the talk that Brent Chapman gave at the DevOps Enterprise Summit in Las Vegas in 2018, describing his experiences as an SRE leader at Google, as well as at Apple and Netflix. 
He's not only a technology leader, but he's also spent time as an air search and rescue pilot and as an incident commander for major festivals such as Burning Man. So one of the first things that Trent showed us was the ballroom that he mentioned in this interview, the first site where they administered vaccines. We retraced the steps that people would take as they park their cars, uh, go up the elevators, uh, then queue up to uh, get vaccinated. He described the many changes that they made to improve flow until they realized that the amount of space was going to cap them at around 500 vaccinations per hour. And then he took us to this amazing conference room that overlooked the nearly 116,000 square feet of exhibit hall space. It was like being on the catwalk overlooking the plant floor in the Phoenix Project. I have a panoramic picture where you could actually see that vast space divided up into the initial queuing area, on-site registration, a uh, special area where people would go if they had allergies so they could be seen by doctors and other exceptions. Uh, they would then queue into, I think, six vaccination pods. Behind curtains, uh, you could sort of see the pharmacy preparation area where there were scores of people preparing the Pfizer vaccine for administration. I'm looking at the CDC site about the Pfizer vaccine. Apparently, there are six doses per vial. You have to thaw them for two hours. If you click into how to thaw, prepare, and administer the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, you see a list of 14 steps. The steps include how you need to mix it in the vials, how you need to invert it 10 times, mix it in the syringe. Uh, you have to use it within six hours. And through this cascade of work, the end product from that work center are trays with syringes, each with vaccine doses in them, ready to be jabbed into people's arms. So that gets to the next area of flow, which is where I suppose the action really happens, uh, the jabbing. So. Uh, there were about six or so pods uh, in each. There might have been 10 or so jabbers. They seemed to be grouped by what healthcare system they came from. Uh, one was primarily National Guard, who I understand were often medics. And so once you get jabbed, you then flow into an observation area where uh, they would sit and be observed for any reactions for 15 minutes. And it's during that time when they would be approached to schedule the second appointments. And as Trent said, people could get in and out within 35 minutes. What is so interesting to me is that in like Dr. Spears' description of the Toyota production system, the number of improvements are so vast that they're difficult to list off one by one from memory. So what we observed that day was this incredible process that was just flowing, uh, which was the end state derived from hundreds, if not thousands of little improvements uh, made day after day or week after week for three and a half months. Which gets us to number five. I love that Mr. Green mentioned that there was a suggestion box, QR code, that everyone could use to describe the current condition, uh, their proposal or suggestion, along with what the expected improvement would be. I love that this structure helped facilitate thinking through experiments, like a well-formed feature request or a bug report form, where the people working on solving the problem can get the information they need uh, without uh, bogging down <laughs> the person having to fill out the form. Which gets us to number six. Uh, holy cow, there's so many great things to reflect upon in this interview. But I love how Trent talked about the slower cognitive problem solving uh, that leaders were tasked with, such as setting the system level goals, uh, going through the math of how many people do we need to vaccinate to get to 70% herd immunity? How many can we possibly deliver per day? How many people do we need to deliver those vaccines? Uh, what would be the shift of operations? Uh, where are we going to source those people? Uh, at one point, uh, Trent was showing Dr. Streer and I the results board. So around the time we visited, uh, they were doing about 8,000 vaccines per day, and all but 10 of those were Pfizer vaccines. Uh, and so apparently there's this huge logistical burden for the 10 Moderna vaccines that were being delivered. And so there were discussions going on about how to phase out uh, the Moderna delivery and move that to other vaccination sites, especially since it's apparently an easier uh, vaccine to handle and administer, which would allow them to focus on just specializing on the Pfizer vaccine. All of those things, I think, represent those skills that the best leaders bring to bear when they think about solving big problems. 
setting those system level goals, designing the organization, assigning the roles, responsibilities, and the relationships between them. And of course, uh, maybe most importantly, assessing and helping judge the performance of the system and help enable the next improvement. Let's go back to the interview where I ask Mr. Green about the fast versus slow integrated problem solving styles that he's had to employ early versus late in the vaccination journey. Steve, before we ask you for your impressions, Trent, one of the things that Steve and I have been trying to conceptualize is sort of the different modes that leadership operates in. And just like in the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, we're saying there's kind of really kind of two modes. One is the slow cognitive problem solving that is, uh, I think, often attributed to planning. So when you talk about like these goals, right, end the mass vaccination center by no later than fall, right? As you think about like, what's the ideal distribution mixes of Pfizer versus Moderna mm-hmm. versus the fast tempo of operations. And I think kind of our observation is that if you look at whether it's sort of the before state and team of teams, there's a pattern where leadership overreaches into operations, <laughs> right? So using kind of the much lossier mechanisms of going up and down the organization is slower, it's not doesn't have as much high fidelity and often ends up <laughs> you know, leading to not great outcomes. I guess the question is, did you find yourself operating more in this kind of slower state of the slower activities of improvement and planning and less so in this kind of overreaching into operations. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, it completely resonates. You know, I think as leaders, we slow things down. If we have to be involved in every step outside of kind of the high level direction that we want things to go, we just slow things down. We often have our hands in too many things to have enough continuity to really affect the day-to-day operations. So end goal is we'd like to shut this down by no later than August 31st, having administered all the vaccinations that we had targeted. So actually, I should qualify that. We actually did start with a number target. This is how many we think we need to do. The other principles that I think we helped and it set context for the operation were things like, we're going to go scheduled only. This is too complex of an operation to do just an open thing. I think you've seen that across the country where people just had open access. And we made a a principled decision early on that given the complexities, the two-dose regimen and so on, they're only going to go scheduled only. That was the only way we were going to operate this. And so I think we outlined some higher level principles. And then, Gene, to your point, we unleashed the creativity of the teams who were involved in the, these things, the, the technology team with the EMR. Okay, how are we going to do this? The, the teams that are, that are used to scheduling in our healthcare operations. Okay, how are we going to schedule these patients? Are they going to go in and schedule their own appointments? We unleashed all that creativity with the overarching principles that we were trying to achieve. And only when they encountered a big roadblock or needed a big decision on something did they come to us. And we tried to not overreach into operations. We really did try and allow the experts. And this was actually made more complicated, I think, in this instance, because as I mentioned, we had four health systems that came together. (laughs) The other principle we said to them is, look, we are not going to tolerate infighting between the health systems. We do compete on a day-to-day basis. This is in the best interest of our community. There is no competition. The only competition here is the best idea wins. So best solution, best process, best whatever. We're not taking the Kaiser process for this or the legacy process or arguing about who's better at this, that, or the other thing. And so I think with our overarching principles and then unleashing of the teams to come up with ideas on, okay, how would we accomplish this goal? That's how we were able to do what we've been able to do. Maybe we can segue from that amazing story about the the vaccination process. And by the way, uh, on behalf of a grateful populace, (laughs) what Steve and I were expressing our appreciation for everything that you've done. Let's go to the broader healthcare system. And so Trent, I remember you and I were hanging out at the bar at Tusk in December 2019. And you mentioned a story that I literally have been pondering ever since. And I'm not sure if this was entirely joking, but you described that you were standing up the safety meeting every day and that you had to be there because, you know, if I understood correctly, you were the only sanctioned interface between, say, nursing and transport or pharmacy. And in other words, for integrated problem solving to happen between those areas, you had to get involved. So it was like up eight, down eight. And so Mm -hmm. Steve and I talked about this for months because it so much resonated with his own experiences in healthcare systems. So Trent, can you talk a little bit more about the story? Did I take that too literally? And even if it's an exaggeration, uh, why do you think it's so important? Yeah, you, you probably took it a little bit literally, <laughs> but but not much. I mean, the, the, you know, the reality is oftentimes if there's an IT 
issue in one of our, um, it just so happens that our chief information officer's office is right next to mine. <laughs> and it wouldn't matter whether it was right next to mine or at three doors down. What often happens is an operational issue comes all the way up to me. I have to go knock on the door <laughs> next door or, or, or text my, uh, my colleague, and then it goes straight down in, in his chain. I think that is not uncommon in our organizations, and it's certainly not uncommon historically at Legacy. I think uh, I've been involved with other healthcare organizations. I think it's not uncommon at all. We are actually trying to break that, as I mentioned earlier, with we're trying to implement an operating system that has a very clear help chain process that is totally separated from a tiered huddling process. One thing I am learning is that I think in a lot of organizations, people have gotten excited about safety huddles and, and so on. It's often a crutch, in my view. A tiered huddle is often a crutch for an ineffective help chain, meaning you shouldn't have to batch your problems and come to the daily tiered huddle in order to let somebody in supply chain know that you had a problem yesterday with these gloves or these masks or whatever. There should be a process by which you can activate a help chain real time if you encounter a problem. And there is some of that, but I would say it's largely immature in complex organizations like ours that have multiple sites. And so we are spending some time right now trying to understand and design a help chain process that enables us to actually have people who are in the work elevate their help chain. And only if it is a really significant problem that no one else has been able to solve, should it ever land on, on my desk. I shouldn't have to be involved in the day-to-day -day help chain process for problems that happen in our organizations. I might hear about them the day after at a tiered huddle, which would be a good process. I could learn about what the problem-solving effort that, that people undertook. Uh, so I might get updated on it, but I wouldn't necessarily be involved in the help chain process. And so we're actually trying to design that now as a system because that's not how we have historically operated. People go straight up to the top, they cut over to their colleague, and then it goes down the other. That was the story that I was describing to you. And that still largely exists today, but we are trying as an, as an organization, we are trying to break that because we think it actually slows the overall problem-solving process and ultimately, oftentimes, ends up not having us solve a problem at all. We just put more Band-Aids <laughs> on things. <laughs> we just exercised how quickly can I get to Trent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of the things that you shared with me after those three amazing hours at the vaccination clinic was this intuition that there were lessons being learned you know, in the operations of the vas vaccination clinic that were relevant to this. And you had mentioned things like cardiac surgeries or hip replacements or something. Can you say a little bit more about that? And then Steve, you know, I'd love your reaction because some of this seems eerily f uncannily similar to conversations we've had. Yeah, I guess I, what I was struck with is in this vaccination process, we've demonstrated how we've been able to solve problems and improve processes so rapidly. Look, we went from being able to, we were only able to do 200 vaccines an hour. And actually, that's probably even overstated because because that assumes, as I said earlier, that we actually finished in 10 hours time. And very often we did not finish in 10 hours time. So that means we were only able to do maybe 150, <laughs> maybe 175. We are doing well over a thousand an hour consistently and there's no breaks in process. And so what I have been struck with is how we have, as we have implemented some of these processes, as we have pushed the real-time problem solving to the people that do the work, you know, outline the overarching principles, only get involved in, you know, decisions that, you know, large, like the decision to move from the ballroom to the, to the exhibit hall. That was a key strategic decision that we made, a decision a little bit on, on design, you know, getting away from the two waiting areas and, and some of those sorts of designs. Design concepts, we have been able to demonstrate how you really can improve a process and improve a process very efficiently and effectively. And so I see enormous, this has really opened my eyes as a health system leader to, back to Steve's introduction, to really the true benefits of this work. And as he mentioned, healthcare is a target-rich environment for uh, daily Im improvement with so many systems. And so now my challenge is just how do I take everything that I have learned and try and bring that back in terms of, of principles and implementation on a daily basis in our health system. Steve, this is making me recall the stories about like how in a smaller setting, you know, uh, teams are able to reorganize batch similar work and double the throughput. Steve, can you just react to Trent and maybe tell a little bit about those stories? Yes, yeah, so uh, three reactions. First, earlier Trent had said something like, you know, come the fall, this uh, mass vaccination center will be closed down. And 
you know, hopefully it will never be needed again. But if so, they've been diligently copying lessons learned to open it, you know, at the 800 rather than the 200 level per hour. The, the one thing I, I desperately hope and encourage is that the behaviors associated with going from uh, X to 4X, that you guys, not only you don't put those away, but every day you find some other platform on which to practice those. And for a couple of reasons. One is the, the sort of the practical, which is there's something else right now, which is X, which if it were 4X, people would be delighted, you know, and not only would your patients be delighted, but your uh, your colleagues would be smiling rather than frowning. But the other part is that unlike the cliche about never forgetting how to ride a bike, these skills do get forgotten. And, you know, and I, and I would actually, if I wanted to be really adamant about it, say that you know, by the end of today, that you make a list of the next uh, 10 things that can be platforms for continuing to hone these practices. Anyway, that, that's the first. They've proven their worth, so why throw them out? <laughs> so that's one thought. The second thing I wanted to add was this, uh, it comes back to this theme of microsystems. And to Gene's point about if something is wrong, it has to go up eight across and then back down eight to get fixed. Again, the cause of that is microsystems not threaded together into a real system. And so you're sitting inside a stovepipe and you have to go to the top of the stovepipe to find a connection down to another stovepipe. So th this ability to uh, avoid that comes from doing exactly what you all did, which was building you know, this system of systems to keep things moving along. And that's also really just outstandingly fantastic. You've seen this also play out in a healthcare system, right? The, the batching similar work? There's actually another thought with this, Gene, is that we, we typically batch similar work by function, right? I've seen this, you know, at sort of the relatively small scale of a primary care practice where the medical assistance is treated as one unit and the MDs and the RNs and the, the administration is, is another unit. And I think what we see with Trent's example is this idea of thinking of the batch not vertically by specialty type, but thinking it horizontally by work type. And that there was this period, and it's a temporary period, right? It's in a convention center, and at some point you're going to dismantle a thing, but it's temporary, that temporarily you had a focused flow of work of getting people through these vaccinations with all the criteria that were necessary, the, the super cold storage and the two shots, et cetera, et cetera. And let me just offer, you know, I keep coming back to this idea of building systems of systems rather than having people isolated in microsystems. Focus albeit temporary focus, and sometimes the focus is months, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's just hours. But the idea of focus actually allows the building of those uh, integrated, those threaded systems. And when we don't have focus, when we say, oh, no, we can't be bound by commitment, then we run into this trouble is that when we can't be committed, even temporarily, then we can't create the thread through the system to create systems of systems. And again, I think that's probably a transferable lesson onto those 10 things that are going to be on your list later. One last thought, Gene, is Trent kept referring to this idea of we do the work, we pause, we reflect on the work, we improve the work. And you can imagine there are some people who say, oh, Gene, you have to understand, you know, our environment is so tumultuous that we never have time to actually create standards and reflect on this. We just have to be improvisational the whole time. And I just want to say that's a profoundly stupid thing to do. And, and I don't mean that in like a judgmental way. I mean, it really <laughs> is stupid, right? Because, you know, back to Kahneman and Tversky, and look, their point is that we think in two modalities. One is fast thinking, one is slow thinking. And fast thinking is great. It has its efficiencies that we have these ingrained habits. And when we have a trigger, we have a response. And it's both time efficient, it's energy efficient, it's brain efficient. And then we have the slow thinking, and the slow thing is where we have to be deliberative when we're burning a lot of BTUs in our brain, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we can sometimes go deep and thoughtful on that, but it's wicked slow. Now, I think what Trent was describing was a meshing of fast and slow and fast and slow all the time. So we do something, which is our standards. That's the fast thinking piece, which we've created a standard, trigger response, trigger response. Then we pause and we say, Trigger response, how well did that work for us? All right, now let's get into the slow thinking, which is the deep thing and the creative thinking. And then let's create a new standard so we can be in the fast thinking. So th th that's like the best of both worlds, right? Which it it's taking advantage of the slow thinking for the creativity and taking advantage of the fast thinking for the, uh, the efficiency. 
Now, for those who push back and say, well, Trent, you have to understand that I have to always be improvisational. Basically, what they're saying, in other words, is that I always have to be fast thinking. Well, fast thinking basically says that you're not being creative. And that's why I say, for those who say that, it's really a stupid answer. Because basically, they're saying, we want to act only on impulse. We want to act only on impulse and not through the deep contemplative creative stuff for which uh, human beings are uniquely capable. Mm-hmm. So, um, And Trent, before I get your reaction, Steve, there's one story that I'd just love for you to share, which was about primary care practice that basically decided, you know, we're going to only do X type of work one day, yeah. another type of work in one other day. Uh, could you just share that story? Yeah, Trent, this, this is a small scale example of, and actually it, it got into vaccinations way back when it was flu vaccinations. But anyway, here, here is the problem. So you have this uh, primary care practice, uh, Mass General Revere, and I'm giving a name because uh, they discussed it. They should be wicked proud of what they accomplished. So uh, I don't think I'm embarrassing anybody. And their concern was that that they weren't meeting their patient needs, that if someone needed an appointment, it was a long way to get an appointment. Once they showed up, it was a long time. You know, the the touch time versus uh, time in the office was just a crazy ratio. And they started asking the question, well, if we're working so hard, right, which they were, you know, if you you looked at any of the care providers, they were all busy. Said, how can we be so busy and so unproductive? And what they found out when they they started uh, shadowing each other for some period is that, they were busy, but they were busy reconfiguring the system all the time, as opposed to busy caring for patients. And, and here's where the reconfiguration comes in, is that when they started uh, shadowing each other and then they shot, started shadowing patients through the system, they realized, and again, it's kind of interesting, that this was a quote-unquote, and I say air quotes with a lot of sort of disclaimer on that, you know, quote-unquote, that uh, this was just adult primary care. So it was no pediatrics, no geriatrics, no specialty care. You know, about as simple, and again, I'm saying this just to make the point, right? As simple as it gets. Well, when they started shadowing each other instead of shadowing patients, what they discovered is that it wasn't simple, that they actually had 12 different appointment types, you know, depending on whether you were a first-time patient, follow-up on a condition, uh, physical, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and it turned out when they started looking at the flow of work for each of those appointment types, it was different. And so what it would happen was if you arbitrarily schedule patients based only on the availability of the doctor, everyone else had to reconfigure who went first, who went second, what work did they have to do, to whom did they have to give the output of that work, what was the output, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, this is freaking crazy. Because why should we be spending so much of our creative energy on figuring out who goes first, second, and third each time and then having to reconfigure? So what they did is they said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to have fixed flows of temporary fixed flows of work. The key is uh, both temporary and fixed. And they said, Dr. Wheel, that was one of the guys involved. He was the medical director of the practice. He said, Dr. Wheel, 8 to 10 in the morning, we're not giving you any of 12 appointments. We're giving you three. And the reason we're giving you only three, not 8 to 10 in the morning on a Monday, is that those three flows of work are more or less the same. It won't require reconfiguration. Now, for patients who need another appointment type, you know, there'll be three different from 10 to 12 and three different from 12 to 2, 2 to 4, et cetera. And then we'll mix it up over the week. And then for the pushback, the people said, oh, yeah, but, the, you know. So if the patient really, really needs to see Dr. Wheel, well, if they can't make um, 8 to 10 on a Monday, maybe they can come into 10 to 2 on the Tuesday. They can only come in at 8 to 10 on a Monday for that appointment type. Maybe they can see uh, Dr. Amy instead of Dr. Eric, all right? So anyway, it, it was crazy. By this simple act of finding out how many appointment types there were, um, committing to this temporary fixed flow of work, you know, two hours at a time, they doubled their throughput, I mean, and this is freaking insane. It, they doubled it. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, it went up 5%, 10%. You know, it's doubled. Now, you start thinking about what double and, and Gene, I just want to point out that this is a, a town north of Boston called Revere. They had 24 different languages they had to support in the community. So it wasn't just a matter of aligning the doctors, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, the uh, physician's assistants. This thing. You also had interpreters. Like you had to make sure that onto the appointment type, you had the translator into Vietnamese or Farsi or Arabic or whatever else. All right. Anyway, they doubled their capacity and, and made the work easier. Uh, that's extraordinary because – what happens when you double your capacity and the community hasn't doubled in size, it means that <laughs> people no longer have to wait for weeks 
to get an appointment with a doctor. You know, some appointments are next day. And some appointments, which might have been days worth of waiting, were like, well, yeah, just show up. Someone will see you. It was just phenomenal. And, and again, you know, the reason I'm so excited by this example, one, it was really an exciting piece of work to have done. And I really like the people with whom I worked. But the other part is, um, though this was primary care, adult primary care, and, and, and Trent was talking about vaccination. And this was a much smaller population that Trent was dealing with. The principles are the same, right? And, and actually, Trent, let me just tie it back together. So at one point, these people got so damn good at mapping out the flow of work and creating these temporary standards that it got the flu season. And they also had, you know, like these two, four, eightfold increases. So it started off that there was some piddling number. I, I actually, Gene, I think, you know, product plug here in the one of the chapters in my book on healthcare we talk about this so we can check the actual numbers but it's crazy i think they had this crazy increase in flu vaccination where it got so fast the um the rate limiter on the process was the elevator time <laughs> right and, like everything else is like because the problem with the elevator because we're talking boston area and flu season is that one people had a park then they had to get into the elevator they go up the elevator down there and the elevator only had a certain capacity even pre-covid it had <laughs> you know a set number of people and then when they got in the office they had to sit down take off a coat so they said you know what screw that don't even come into the office just drive through the parking lot slow down with the window open and just make sure your sleeve is rolled up on the appropriate arm you know passenger side right and driver's side left and we'll just jam you as you go through <laughs> and you know and it was phenomenal anyway you know what, what was the storyline here is they did exactly exactly what what trent and his colleagues did so anyway thank you for prompting that very pleasant thought Trent, I mean, like when you told me that story outside of the uh, convention center, I was like, I was like, I got to connect yeah. with Steve. I mean, does that uh, resonate with you at all? Oh my god, it's incredible! And what I find f fantastic about it, that story is when you get into this work, you start to uncover constraints you never thought was a constraint. Who ever thought the elevator speed was going to be a constraint? We now have a constraint at our at the convention center parking. The parking lot is huge. I couldn't imagine that parking was ever going to be a constraint. There's only 1,800 spots. We process 1,100. So can we get enough people into the parking lot, in and out of the parking lot uh, fast enough in order to keep up our throughput? One thing I am struggling with, actually, is, is we think about the, this. World. Well, first of all, anybody who doubts that healthcare isn't a target-rich opportunity for, in, for implementing these principles is crazy. And it's, you just have to listen to, to Steve's story there, our experience. Um, I, I see it. One thing I am struggling with, though, is this concept of focus. So as you articulated, there's only one product that we're delivering at the MassFax site. It is a single shot. Where I am struggling in my learning and application is you think about our most complex medical center, a manual medical center. We do hundreds of surgeries a day. They're not all different, but there's a lot of hips, there's a lot of knees, there's cardiac surgery in there. It happens to be a burn center, so there might be a few burn patients. I mean, it's not single-threaded. Uh, I, I would love to hear your thoughts, and, and I think your story about the primary care is a good one, because you can start to break these down into, into simple things that can be improved for all. I've seen, I am a believer, I am trying to now drive these uh, these improvements or this philosophy throughout our entire enterprise. Uh, but I will encounter resistance to your point, and not just on the fast thinking or the slow thinking, but just, oh, well, we're different. And yeah, you did all that at the convention center, but it was one thing that you had to do. We have a heart surgery followed by a, by, by a hip surgery. Help me in, in my learning as to how to bring people along um, and what maybe some of the principles are that I can help um, uh, you know, common platforms that I can I can utilize. Yes, so uh, I'll, I'll give with the sarcastic answer first, which is why do you follow a heart surgery with a hip surgery? <laughs> yeah, no, but and, and let, let me unpack the sarcasm. That was just to make the point and, and be a little less dismissive. So first of all, there are the places where you have um, limited predictability, limited control. So, um, you know, emergent care. That you know, you, yes. emergent care exists for the stuff you simply don't schedule. You know, there, there's the slip on the ice, the bang of the head, the ingestion of the foreign object, et cetera, et cetera. Those are situations where, and actually, we did some work with emergency medicine as opposed to surgical stuff, where they actually were able to create a flow of work and get patients uh, in the front door from the time they got in the front door to the time they were um, examined with uh, their first round of medical orders was 18 minutes. I mean, it's solidly 18 minutes. So this whole idea of what you did at the uh, the vaccination center of mapping out the flow of work and seeing 
how you, you could um, standardize, stabilize it. Even in em some emergent work, some portions of that can be done. But l let's say there's the other stuff you just you can't anticipate and nothing looks. All right, so that's why you have pods, which is you put into a room a patient with a particular, let's say, idiosyncratic or even unique set of conditions. You put the specialists in there around that person, and they work out what they're going to do in a way that they're um, – disconnected and otherwise buffered from the rest of the system. So the um, the tempo of the rest of the system is not corrosive of their efforts inside the pod. And what they're doing inside the pod is not corrosive of the tempo overall. So that's that special case. But then you get into the question of these different threads, which is presumably the work during, before, and after uh, a hip replacement is uh, substantially different than the work before and after and during a valve replacement, and even a knee replacement for that matter. And if that's the case, then it does beg the question, um, can you run hips, knees, and hearts uh, in parallel? Or can you, you know, depending on the number of cases and the, uh, the amount of the facility, can you run some period of temporary focus for hearts and then some period of temporary focus on hips and some period of temporary focus on knees before you loop back and start doing hearts again? This issue, look, just one more thinking out loud, is that I, I appreciate the pushback you'll get. And you get it in a lot of industries, whether it's a service industry, not, not healthcare, but another, oh, every, every uh, client or customer is different. You get it in manufacturing, oh, we have such high variety, low volume manufacturing. But the thing I would offer is uh, just do the peer-to-peer uh, the -peer observation of how much of a person's day is spent actually doing something a patient would care for and how much is spent actually reconfiguring. And um, the more time committed to reconfiguring, the less capacity you have to actually meeting patient need. So th that's part of the persuasion. Now, the, one last thought on this is, you know, as you were giving your narrative about the vaccine center, I think what was coming through was that the um, amount of time you ran before you could uh, take a breath, reflect, and reconfigure at first, which you had to run a lot because of how slow you are relative to the demand on the system. But as you got um, the system better and more skilled, the, the amount of time you had to run before you could pause, reflect, and correct shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And to an outsider coming in and looking at this today, they'd probably say, wow, they keep just reconfiguring because you're so good at the, uh, the temporary focus and the reconfiguration and the next temporary focus. Now, anyway, carrying that over to hips, knees, and hearts is, uh, I bet once you start looking at how much time people are spent spend reconfiguring, then you'll identify the things that take a long time and a lot of effort to reconfigure. And you'll figure out how to Kaizen those two. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you know, even if you have to run hearts, hips, and knees sequentially, your batch size can go down. Well, uh, Trent, I'm so glad you're interjecting in here. This delights me to no end. And Trent, well, I remember telling you also at the convention center that uh, you know Steve telling that story about the 60 line side store changes per day and yeah. how the VP of manufacturing for a big three auto manufacturer said that's that's insane. They're probably lying or being disingenuous, <laughs> right? We tried six, and uh, that didn't work so well. We shut down uh, car production for three days because you know parts didn't end up to where they need to be and we couldn't do final assembly and so forth. And for me, what that revealed was the notion of bringing down the cost of change. I think, Steve, uh, what you're describing is that a high setup time <laughs> it has a very high cost of change. And one of the things that Trent is talking about is they were able to bring down the cost of change so they could dynamically reconfigure, dynamically adapt. And so that ramp of learning <laughs> you know, was now increased. Uh, Steve, am I, uh, Trent, am I interpreting that story correctly? Yeah. I, I like that phrase, the cost of change came down so the frequency of change could go up. Yeah, and Steve's exactly right. Our, our plan, do, check, act, or just cycles were, you know, they're really micro now. I mean, they very rapid. They were much slower. You know, we spent a lot of time in the plan, probably not as much time in the do, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the check. And, and I think we're getting much better at, at that. And that's actually a principle we're trying to bring back into our health system is we, we spend an enormous time on the P. We often spend very little time on the D, <laughs> the do. Um, and then we are terrible, historically terrible at the checking and adjusting. And and what we're really trying to do and what we tried to do in the mass facts is, you know, 
plan quickly, do, implement, but then spend way more time on the checking. Did, did we get the result that we had anticipated? And yes or no, and then how might we adjust? You know, Trent is talking very much about this very disciplined scientific method of planning something, declaring a hypothesis, doing something, testing the hypothesis, and then reflecting on it. It may sound like a little bit of semantics, but I just want to give credit back to this PDCA thing and how some people fall into a trap. So the trap is you plan, you do, you check. What is the checking? Did I do according to the plan? And then, you know, and then what, how do I act? Well, if that's my model, then I'm supposed to do according to the plan. And then I check and I have it. Then the action is punitive, which is, you know, shame on you for not following the plan. Now, Edwards Deming, who popularized this cycle, I don't believe he called it plan, do, check act. He called it plan, do, study act. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because study means uh, invest a little time to try and understand the gap. And the action then is to, uh, once you've understood the gap, it invites corrective action rather than punitive action. And, and, and of course, what Trent and his colleagues were doing in that convention center, I think was really true to Deming's intent, which was plan, capture your best. De Deming talked so much about the generation and use of profound knowledge. And so what do you do with planning? You take whatever knowledge you have, profound or not, or quasi-profound or partially profound, but you take your best knowledge and declare, this is uh, my best understanding. Then you do according to that, and then you study to uh, generate more profound knowledge on which you can act. And, and look, everything Trent was saying is very consistent with, I, with, I, with what I think uh, Dr. Deming intended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Trent, one last kind of theory testing. So as we were sort of discussing you, <laughs> and uh, it was actually a great story from a pharmaceutical substitute, the different functional specialties for chemists and biologists and you know the purificationists, <laughs> and you see the same dynamic. My whole area of study around DevOps, right? Same thing. Development, QA, operations, uh, security, same thing. And so kind of a recent sort of conjecture is that kind of as the leader, our hypothesis is that one moves from this very much uh, kind of in the act, react, uh, expedite, mode to one of, um, uh, I'm just still trying to figure out the words for it, but contemplation, study, reconfiguration of the system, and, and then kind of the assessment of. So is that spectrum something that resonates with you in terms of like maybe on your worst days to kind of maybe where you would ideally see yourself feel like in five years, if you can force this into being as you I'm sure will. <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess the way I've been thinking about it, the term I would use for what I think you're describing is coach. And <laughs> You know, so often now, again, and I struggle with this. You know, here I am. I've, you know, I've been in healthcare for twenty years. I've had all these experiences. I'm supposed to have the answer. So, okay, here's the broken system. To Trent, to, to call Trent. What's the answer? And and what I'm what I'm trying to transform myself into is I, not just. I don't know the answer. I mean, I might think I know an answer, but better are the people that are doing the work every day, seeing what the challenges are. So how do I turn myself into a coach and help them come up with the right solution and keep pushing and learning? Because I'm trying to, we're trying to create ourselves, to, trying to turn into a learning organization and and push people to get better every day and utilize these principles. And and uh, I love the, the statement that this is not like, uh, it's not like riding a bike. This muscle needs to get exercised all the time, consistently. And so what I would say, Gene, is, yeah, that what I'm trying to turn myself into effectively is a coach, um, which at times can be really, really challenging because there are times where I really think I know the answer and I just want to say, no, this Give is me the ball. Doing, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. The, no, the, here's, here's, what, here's what you're going to do. But I'm trying to, to relearn myself, coach myself, not to deliver that answer, but to help tease it out of people. Steve, I have to imagine you will validate this intuition, right? Given like the last half of your book, right? This is exactly you know the what was embodied in uh, your study of not just the production system, but at the most senior levels of leadership. I think that very much matches how they viewed themselves, Steve. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Look, um, you know, any organization, whether it's uh, five fifty, five thousand, half a million, um, that's a lot of brains. You start thinking about it in terms of BTUs, right? You know, it, it, it's some crazy number that the, uh, what is it, Trent? You, you would know this better than me, but isn't it like a quarter of your BTUs spent every day is by your brain? 
right? Yeah, yeah I think and, so. And there's yeah, some crazy yeah. numbers, Gene. Like in the midst of a, a chess tournament, the Grand Masters, they're burning like six, ten thousand calories a day. There's like yeah, Michael exactly. Phelps training for the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 crazy. All right, so th- th- think about just the energy efficiency problem here. You've got all those brains burning all those calories, and um, as a leader, you know your, your default. What it's going to be that you're not going to put those brains to good use. I mean, it, it, make, it makes no freaking sense, right? So um, what we're talking about in this coaching model, which uh, Trent was alluding to, was uh, how do we take advantage of that distributed intelligence? You know, all those engines of creativity, which are just sitting there idling anyway, right? I mean, the engine is running. They're burning calories. So put it to good stinking use. And on top of that, if you start creating these threading mechanisms, not only do you have the distributed intelligence, you now have the collective intelligence, of people having conversations about, well, here's my work, what's your work, how does that work come together? How can the two of us do the work in such a way that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? And now the only way that's going to happen, though, is that if uh, Trent and his, uh, his, his colleagues coach people how to behave that way and have those conversations. But what a freaking multiplier. I mean, you know, no, no offense, Trent, but, but you know, whatever BTUs your brain is burning in a day, its creative potential is nothing compared to the 100 people in the convention center or the 200 people in the convention center who, if you could get that, you know, tap into their creative engines, oh my God, you know? Yeah, 100%. Gene here. Steve had mentioned the flu vaccination effort, one of the many improvements made at Mass General Revere, which was indeed described in his book, High Velocity Edge. On page 330, there's a table that describes the vaccinations administered during two-hour sessions. And in session number one, it was 43 vaccines delivered to 71 to uh, 151 delivered in the third observed session. So there's your 4x improvement in throughput. But it gets even better than that because the table then shows the number of clinical staff required to support them, which is reduced from three and a half people to two and a half, which drives the number of flu shots administered per hour per person from 6.1 to 14.2 to 30.2. And so that's a 5x improvement. If you're interested in the work that Steve described, uh, there's a whole chapter on this and it's just a fantastic read. Okay, number two. I had mentioned that I had spent the time with Mr. Green at the Portland Convention Center with Dr. Chris Streer, an emergency room physician and who will soon be chief medical officer at Columbia Memorial. He gave a fantastic talk at the DevOps Enterprise Summit two weeks ago, and so many people mentioned that it was one of their favorite talks. He described the work that went into his book, Smash the Bottleneck, Fixing Patient Flow for Better Care and a Better Bottom Line, where, among other things, he was able to reduce the ambulance divert time from six hours per month, where the emergency department were unable to accept incoming ambulances, often due to lack of availability of beds, down to 45 minutes per month. But he also described how flow has never been so important in this time of COVID. He described how last year it was the first time he felt like his life was actually in danger, driving him to make sure that his will was in order after years of procrastinating, and that he was unable to see his kids for nearly a year. But here's what hit him. We know from Dr. Patrick Cowley, CEO of Medical University of South Carolina Health Systems, described in the first break-in, that volumes in the emergency department are down significantly. Dr. Streer described how he went from seeing 25 patients per shift down to a mere handful. He described how in one shift, there were only three patients in the emergency department, the slowest he's ever seen, but one of whom was on a ventilator, and it still took six hours to move that patient from the emergency department to the ICU. He kept thinking, this is one patient in a nearly empty hospital. What happens when we're overwhelmed with dying patients? How will we handle that? And that's what scared him. I will put a link to this short 15-minute talk in the show notes, and I think there are lessons relevant to any technology leader. And third, lastly, on coaching. You may have heard me laugh when Mr. Green mentioned that he saw himself more and more as a coach. So I laughed for a couple reasons. One reason is that Mr. Green was actually the coach for my oldest kid's softball team back in 2015. He was a fantastic coach and exhibited all of the patience you need when dealing with six-year-olds who are playing a sport perhaps for the first time, which was definitely the case for my son, Reed. Number two, 
the role of head coach seems so interesting. Steve and I have talked numerous times about coaches in American football. I'm not an expert on sports, but the role of coach seems like a very interesting analog. I am reading from an article called A Detailed List of an NFL Coach's Responsibility from the Bleacher Report. We see them in press conferences after games, during the combine, and yelling on the sideline each Sunday, but very few of even the most intense fans know what an NFL coach actually does. It really varies from coach to coach and from team to team. Every team has a fit they like, and every coach has a way they like doing things. But there are some very consistent and regular things an NFL coach is responsible for. So I'm just going to read some of the bullet points off. Post-game analysis. It's a coach's job to hit the game tape almost immediately after the game is over to figure out what worked and what didn't. Number two, game planning. Implementing whatever the staff learned from the preceding game is only part of getting ready for the next week. The coach will also look at the last game or two of the team's upcoming opponent and use all that information along with the assistant coaches and the offensive and defensive coordinator to come up with a way to beat the next team. Number three, practice makes perfect. All the while, the head coach is making sure things get done on the practice field. And then number four, game time. When the day of the game comes, a head coach is still tweaking the game plan. During the game, they'll continue to make adjustments based on success or failure of the plan that they have come up together over the past week, keeping that bird's eye view of the action in the sense that they need to know what is happening with every aspect of the team. How is the quarterback holding up after that big hit in the first quarter? Is the middle linebacker handling that hamstring strain? And so on and so forth. All of that information goes into adjusting the game plan that was worked on all week so that it works in the second half. Most of the major decisions come down to the head coach as well. Sure, the offensive coordinator might call the plays, but the head coach is the one who pushes for that big fourth down play or the fake field goal attempt. It's the head coach who will be facing the press corps after the game to talk about every decision that was made. So I find this interesting because nowhere in that job description of the football coach is it to get on the field and actually play the ball. (laughs) Most of the work is happening before the game. So I'm finding the metaphor of the sports team coach as a very appropriate metaphor for what the job of the leader actually is more in the slower modes of cognitive thinking around planning and assessment and not so much getting involved in daily operations. That is in the domain of the people on the team who are actually on the field. We will explore this, I'm sure, in future episodes. Okay, I had mentioned that I had so many more questions for Mr. Green, but because of time limitations, we couldn't get to all of them. So I am very much hoping that we will be able to do this again with Mr. Green and Dr. Spear uh, in the weeks to come. So let's go back to the interview where Trent describes how he can be reached and what topics he would like to be reached out to about. Trent, I actually had a bunch of questions I've still queued up, but uh, I know you have a hard stop. Uh, so I'll end on on this. Uh, Trent, thank you so much for being here with uh, Steve and me uh, and sharing your experiences, your expertise, and you know for such without a doubt, the most societally important problem on this planet, of which everyone's health and economies uh, re- you know, reside upon. So if people want to reach out to you, how can they do that? And is there anything in particular that you want people to reach to you about? Well, I just want to, I want to thank you and Dr. Spear for having me. This has been fun. People can reach out to me. They can find Legacy Health. They can find my bio on LegacyHealth.org. My email address, we can probably put it in your show notes, and I'd be happy to have people reach out to me. And you know, I'm trying to find other learners that have hooked on to these ideas that Steve and others have been talking about for a long time. So anybody who has, they're willing to share, I'd be more than happy to connect with them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Trent and Steve. I hope you learned a ton and were as inspired as I was by all the amazing achievements by Mr. Trent Green and team who are now vaccinating over 8,000 people per day here in Portland, Oregon. Going to the Oregon Convention Center, seeing the work being done there has been one of the highlights of my year. It is truly awesome to see the scale of the mission and to what extent human creativity has been unleashed in service of the most important mission on the planet today to vaccinate everyone on the planet in the fastest possible time. So next time, we'll resume the COVID-related topics. This time, whether or not just-in-time supply chains made the COVID-related shortages worse or better. 
From one perspective, you have articles published in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal claiming that just-in-time made shortages worse. On the other side, we have Dr. Steven Spear, who has been studying this area for 20 years, who will assert that just-in-time ameliorated those shortages, and had it not been for just-in-time, the shortages would have been far, far worse. This was such an interesting interview, and I look forward to sharing it with you. See you then. Thank you.